This is my home water, the Huntington River. Starting in the shadows of Campbell's Hump, the Huntington winds a maze-like path through a series of farm fields, picking up speed before dumping into a steep, boulder-strewn gorge. The water stays cold much of the year, and its network of deep holes are a favorite of swimmers in the summer. But swimmers are not the only ones who enjoy this clear blue water. Rainbow trout find the sustained sequence of cold, oxygen-rich water teeming with structure and food to be a worthy habitat to call home. And inevitably, where there's fish, there's fishermen chasing after them, searching for a fleeting glimpse of the sleek and beautiful creatures who live below the surface. With opportunities to sight fish to trout in this gin clear water, it's easy to imagine you're in Slovenia or in New Zealand and not an obscure stream in Vermont. The rainbow trout is the most well-known and popular trout, especially to the general public. Yet, originally, the rainbow calls home regions of California, Oregon, and Washington. How did it get to Vermont? What fish lived in rivers like this before their arrival? Why aren't those fish here anymore? I wish that I could see what the hell is wrong with me, but I don't know I'm getting there, but it's getting so hard. I guess I should have known the way to let it go, but I don't know I'm getting there and it's breaking your heart. To answer that question, we must head up into the headwaters amongst the shadows of the mountains. There, a different species resides, one that's thrived there since the last ice age. Salvalinus fontanalis, the brook trout. The brook trout is Vermont state fish and can be found on license plates and logos across the state. It is one of the three native salmonid populations that still exists in Vermont. People that come here, whether they're resident or non-residents that want to fish, the brook trout is the number one sought after species. The brook trout still is the golden jewel of, of what people want to come here to um, pursue. Contrary to their name, they're in fact not a trout, but a subspecies of the char family. Brook trout tend to not be highly regarded for their size, well, at least anymore in Vermont. A standard brookie runs anywhere from 4 to 8 inches, with fish over 12 inches being considered a trophy. Rather, they are famed for their vibrant colors, 
Orange bellies and green backs, yellow spots and blue and red halos and black and white tipped fins. Brook trout are the wardens of the north, flourishing in high elevations with cold water. Yet, while they thrive in water temperatures of 50 and 60 degrees and neutral pH levels, brook trout are very sensitive to environmental changes, making them a key indicator species. They are the shepherds of Vermont's alpine waterways and the poster child for the protection of endangered native trout. Brook trout are the only trout species native to the Green Mountains and used to live in solidarity over the labyrinth of streams and ponds that would later become Vermont. They were a source of food for the Abenaki and Iroquois, which lived in close conjunction with the land. Then, white settlers arrived, and since then, brook trout have not lived a day free from threats. Dams, invasive species, stocking, climate change, habitat degradation due to industrial development, overfishing, much of their native range has been stolen leaving them extirpated to what highlands still remain. This is a problem not unique to Vermont. All over the East Coast, brook trout's habitat has been shrunk to a fraction of their former range. Above that, you know, 1,800 foot range, 2,200 foot range uh, in Vermont, the, the native brook trout are in, in fine shape and they, um, they're reproducing and they're really healthy. The challenge is to lower the level um, that brook trout can survive in Vermont. And when you get into the valley, big valley rivers in Vermont, having native brook trout populations is virtually impossible. Nonetheless, brook trout are still a favorite target of many anglers, including me. Just stuck one fish right in there on my first cast. Let's see if we can get another. He absolutely chomped that dry fly. It's crazy these brookies that are so small. I mean, they will just tomahawk themselves at anything. Caught a leaf, look at that. Phenomenal. Go book a trip with me, we can catch leaves. I don't even know if I'll need my nymph. I may end up cutting it off here in just a little bit. Oh, I think that was a fish. Next good looking pool. Oop. Oh, I missed him. He's really small though. I missed one that was the size of my fly uh, that I saw at my feet. And that was that out of that pool. Rock. That's the good old classic, pull your fly out of a rock and then land it in a tree immediately. If I don't catch one out of here, I'm gonna be shocked. Yep, got one. Woo! Oh, there he goes. Get out of there. Yep. On the nymph. Little guy. Despite their size and their aggressive nature, these brook trout aren't so easy to catch. Oh, oh I missed him. Well, for me at least. All right, here we go. Come on, fish. Give us one. Give me a freebie. Oh. 
flying into the trees. That's a better one. Very easy spaz. When you hold a brook trout in your hand, it's hard not to admire their resiliency and their beauty. But with each brook trout I catch, I ask myself how much longer will they be able to withstand this full frontal assault? How can we help these native fish survive? All right, before we go any further, let's clear something up. What's the difference between stocked, wild, and native fish? Native trout, like the brook trout, are indigenous to an area and developed in biology purely without human influence. They've never been stocked and live where they naturally developed. Wild trout are trout that are simply reproduced naturally. This can refer to species that are native or to species such as brown and rainbow trout, whose descendants were stocked previously and whose offspring are now accustomed in reproducing within new habitat. Stock trout, which could be a rainbow trout, brown trout, or brook trout, have been raised in captivity at a fish and wildlife facility before being released into a waterway in the spring. Stocking is the practice of raising fish in a hatchery and releasing them into a river, lake, or ocean to supplement existing populations or to create a population where previously none existed. The stocking program in Vermont's another controversial issue where the people from, you know, Trout Unlimited, some of the conservation groups are, are very strong advocates for native fish populations and wild trout management. As far as the stocking program in Vermont, the department's position is that this is a put-and-take situation. Stocking is not a new concept. In 1892, in an effort to replace the brook trout they had harvested in the thousands and whose habitat they destroyed, the first brown trout were introduced to Vermont. And since then, the state has repeatedly provided fresh batches of docile, hatchery-raised foreign trout that have ravaged Vermont's waterways. These fish, accompanied with large and smallmouth bass, outcompeted or straight up devoured what brook trout remained in the lower sections of the major waterways. As Charles Darwin states, the fittest survive in nature, and the shaken brook trout populations whose habitat had been crushed were ill-prepared to combat these new opponents. Yet, despite the widespread negative impact that stocking has had, the state still stocks 650,000 fish a year. There's a formula with, with some different values that we can plug in. Two of the big inputs that really end up determining how many fish we stock are the amount of fishing effort, so the amount of uh, angler hours, so the amount of time that anglers are spending fishing on that water um, in a given year. Um, and then the other thing would be the, um, the number of wild trout present. We know how many wild trout are present by our sampling. We do what's called electrofishing. The brook trout do, do revisit these larger streams, um, like the Lamoille and the Winooski. I mean, the, the, these large rivers have tributaries that's, that contain brook trout in them. And we know that the, uh, these, um, there's, comp there's competition for food and uh, the bigger, bigger non-nays will eat the, bro the uh, brook trout. Yet, the stalking doesn't harm just the native brook trout. Wild brown and rainbow trout are threatened by it too. When the state deems there are insufficient wild populations to meet this quoted angler demand, they will stock on top of these fish nonetheless. Ideally, we're stocking trout in places that don't have any trout. Um, and that's often the case, but there, a lot of our rivers, you know, maybe there's a few trout, a few wild trout that maybe you're there for part of the year or they're just kind of passing through or maybe they live there year round. All populations have what's known in biology as a carrying capacity. This is the population of an organism that a given environment can support. These streams with low numbers of wild trout have what's therefore deemed to be a low carrying capacity. Yet, when stalking is conducted on these streams, it jumps the population numbers well above the carrying capacity of the environment, sentencing a large percentage of those fish to certain death both wild and stalked. Moreover, 
and ensures that these fish have little to no chance of repopulating a stream and increasing the number of wild fish. At best, these populations will remain consistent in their low numbers, if not decrease until these populations are lost altogether. Stocking also blinds anglers to deeper issues beneath the surface. Unknowing anglers may believe that Vermont streams need no support or face no issues when they are able to catch large numbers of stock trout. Yet, this strategy is simply a band-aid over an infected wound. While it is a short-term solution to fill the rivers, it does nothing to address the more pressing issues such as loss of habitat and climate change. Importantly, these brook and rainbow trout that are stocked are sterile, so as to not interwine the stocked and wild populations and create a genetic bottlenecking. Furthermore, rarely will these fish be effectively able to hold over and survive more than one year, most of them dying out in the summer and those that don't in the winter following. Well, for put and take fishing, it's really easy to catch, um, but they do not avoid predation very well, um, and they just don't survive very, very well. But if these stock trout are so bad, why are they being put in the rivers at all? Anglers. So I think the stocking program plays a very significant role in the average angler's ability to catch fish. The reality of it is people want to catch fish. Stocked fish are easier to catch than wild trout. Um, they're less selective. They're more opportunistic in the way they bite. Because of this, the state has been experimenting in a number of rivers with new strains of rainbow trout in an attempt to find a strain that is hardier and able to survive better. But it takes a lot of the fishing pressure off of those other natural trout streams. Stocking can go a long ways to get people on the rivers. Um, and also it can, as you get people on the rivers and interested in that, you can also begin to um, talk with people about the importance of wild and native fish. Similarly, stocking is important in driving the economy and tourism. If we were to reduce Vermont's trout stocking program, I think it would definitely have a significant effect in license sales and participation levels. It eases the barriers of entry and allows people to become invested in the sport and the trout and streams that support them. I know that firsthand as an angler and as a guide, stock trout are vital in supporting guide trips to be run on a daily basis and the influx of out-of-state tourism money that comes to my account every other week. Stocking certainly has its place, and it's an effective tool to generate interest and license in gear sales. While there's a reoccurring expense of $3 million to run the stocking program, the state estimates that this brings in $31 million of the approximately $131 million spent on fishing every year in Vermont. Not to mention the added income brought in by those who spend money on food and lodging in Vermont while here to fish. The state is also careful to take very good care of these fish they stock and make sure they are raised in a safe environment with an assortment of different control measures to ensure they are raised to be healthy fish. You know, we try to make sure that we're, you know, providing the best rearing environment for them, good velocity and rearing units so that they're well exercised um, and, and, and ready to perform. However, it's important to note that in the premier trout fishing in the country, the western states of Montana and Wyoming, Stocking has been done away with entirely. Despite some of the highest number of anglers both within the state and from tourism, this trout are completely wild, stream-born and raised. And this by no means has slowed down the masses of fishermen who flock to Montana to cast stoneflies on the Blackfoot and caddisflies on the Madison. This is the Little River, one of Vermont's specifically designated wild streams. For over five days, along with some friends, I fished this stretch, trying to catch one of the Little's large wild trout. And fished. And fished. And fished. Oh, yeah, that's 
money. While we had quite a few near misses, we'd failed to land one. I struggled for a while with what to do with this section. I'd planned to demonstrate how good the fishing was with the absence of stocking with Pier Wildfish. All three of us knew this firsthand, yet we'd gotten skunked. Yeah, I mean, one time we came through here during a flying ant hatch and from like right where we're standing up to about where that log is, there had to be about six to 10 fish over 16 inches feeding on dries. We didn't catch any of them, but we could see them. Yet, eventually, I realized this highlighted a separate key element. Catching wild trout is hard. Wild trout are cautious, wily, and rarely make the same mistake twice. Wild trout are earned. There are few shortcuts, especially when fishing with flies or artificial lures. Wild trout don't care about how many hours you've been on the river or how cool your new fly is. All they care about is surviving. With its high number of these wild fish, the little's granted additional protection from harvest from anglers. The little has special regulations that reduce the amount of fish you're able to keep, or the creel limit, down from six fish to two. So obviously, the, some of the major issues that face the uh, Vermont Wild Trout Management Program is the management of creel limits, methods of take. And when I served on the Fish and Wildlife Commission, um, which goes back about five or seven years ago when I left, I served for 11 years. <clears throat> Over that course of 11 years, there were two pretty controversial uh, motions that were made to restrict creel limits for Vermont's brook trout populations. The creel limit for the creel limit for brook trout was too high. Previous to um, last year, it was 12 fish. There is also no size restriction on these fish, meaning that hypothetically, if an angler were to catch and keep his limit every day, he would kill and remove from a stream 2,400 brook trout a year. That number of fish being taken out could decimate a stream. The aggregate creel limit for rainbows and browns was six fish. The state cold water fish, uh, we were expecting less than the non-natives, the browns and rainbows. However, due to work done by the Native Fish Coalition and other groups, the limit was eventually reduced to eight. However, there are certainly skeptics of this change. And from a scientific standpoint, the data doesn't support the overwhelming opinion that by reducing creel limits, we would increase the population base. Most of our wild trout populations across the state, um, harvest by anglers has very minimal impacts on our populations. However, this doesn't minimize the benefits of catch and release practices. If we choose, we can also fish and return the fish to the water. Opportunity to, to take to harvest fish if we want, but we also have the opportunity um, as we recreate to be able to return that uh, fish to a stream for someone else to catch or for it to grow bigger. There's no question that anglers can fish out a section of river over the course of a summer by keeping fish. Yet another element of the little success is also one of its most harmful detractors, the dam. The dam is a bottom release dam system meaning that the water from the bottom of the lake is pulled out and distributed to the stream down below, creating what's known as a tailwater. This water tends to remain cold year round since it's pulled from 100 feet below the dam. Yet, as much as dams can help to provide cool oxygenated water, they also prevent nutrients and sediment from reaching downstream areas, increase water temperature below them, and create volatile flow rates. Most importantly, however, they prevent the travel of fish through the river systems. Also, we've been involved with a couple of dam pro removal projects, and dam removals are, are, are fun to do because they're pretty dramatic. They're expensive and they take time because you have to have lots of partners, but um, in Vermont right now, there's uh, a lot of organizations that are actively involved with dam removals. 
This is particularly impactful on one fish, the Atlantic salmon. Famously, salmon each fall will swim upstream out of lakes or the ocean to their ancestral place of birth in order to spawn. Navigating and traveling hundreds of miles through ferocious rapids and waterfalls takes some incredible athleticism. Albeit, despite the salmon's spectacular vertical leap, none of them had the necessary tools to scale hydroelectric dams. I've created obstacles for a uh, once native Atlantic salmon to Vermont. Sounds sounds almost crazy, but it was it was documented that there were Atlantic salmon in, in the White River. Overfished and blocked from their spawning grounds, once famed for their size and abundance on both the Connecticut River and Lake Champlain, Vermont's landlocked salmon were wiped out. In 1972, however, Vermont's Fish and Wildlife began its salmon program in an effort to reintroduce the Atlantic salmon to the waters of its forefathers. While this program struggled to establish a footing early on, salmon have made a strong return in Champlain, and having small but increasing numbers began to travel upstream to spawn using salmon ladders. Elevators that collect salmon allow them to be transported up and above dams. A landlocked Atlantic salmon we get from fish returning back to us from the lake, so they're feral fish. Uh, uh, returning to our, our uh, facility here. They go into a trap down on, our, on the hatchery outfall. We collect the, the, the returning salmon there, bring up the males and females and spawn them here. They're, it looks like they're kind of at a tipping point right now in terms of their health. They've also launched a number of projects to improve aquatic organism passage and to rip out old and unused dams. However, while the small milestones of a hundred of fish swimming upstream is important to celebrate, it is a far cry from the masses of salmon expected in a proper salmon run. Because, um, you know, they don't get too much run of the river on this side, though there is there are fish that are trucked and trapped at the Winooski River and, and, and moved upstream to spawn, you know, you know if, 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 if they can. But as far as natural reproduction, it currently is minimal. I hope that there'll be, you know, perhaps a, a better um, landlocked salmon run in the Winooski over time. But the strongest example of Vermont's potential for the salmon's return is the Clyde River on Lake Memphis Magog. I've been in the darkness for 40 days. I've been searching for holy flames, a sign to light up the way. So can you help me out? Can you help me out? I've been more certain of truth. to Jesus before So can you help me out Oh, can you help me out Am I on my own Am I on my own But can you help me out Am I on You know, 100 years ago or so, the landlocked salmon runs through Newport and the Clyde were, were pretty spectacular. Um, and there were thousands and thousands of fish that were coming uh, up the Clyde every fall. Um, and I think that that fishery 
needs help. I think the uh, I think the state is on the right track in terms of changing the um, the landlocked salmon um, strain that they're going to be using up there. I think it also depends on you know what what kind of um, rains we get in the fall. All right, guys, no lie. There's a salmon I saw like three feet from me. I made one drift, missed a three inch fish, set my hook into a tree. And then I just looked down and see an 18 incher just sitting like three feet in the water. Um, so now I'm gonna go catch this fish. Damn good spot right there. Jeez, it's crazy how well he blends in. I wonder how many people this week or even just today have just walked over him. That's a great drift. Oh, didn't eat, it's right in his head. Oh. I'm hoping you guys can see this. I don't have the polarizer on, but there's a salmon sitting right in the shadows right over there, right underneath that rock. All right, 20 inch salmon here. He won't eat. Well, let's see if we can get a video of him. And I've been trying to sight fish for him for a couple minutes, but he has not cooperated so far. Just lost a really nice, like 18 incher. Just a real bummer. Eventually, though, I was able to get on the board. Finally, Alex capped the day off with his second fish. Sweet. What just happened, Alex? Got a salmon on the Adams. So, yeah, parachute Adams. It was drifting down, I'd had nothing. I was debating, calling it for the day, going warming up in the car, and then saw him hit. Quick hook set, and he was on. Yet there are other ways the trout's environment is shifting. The ever encroaching threat of climate change, like a storm on the horizon, approaches the brook trout populations. Gradually increasing temperatures have lessened the snowpack gathered on Vermont's mountains each year and have led to increasingly earlier springs. The runoff that is created from the melting of this snowpack is crucial to keeping the rivers cold and deep enough through the spring and summer months when rainfall is inconsistent. Even though I think we're going to continue to get a lot of moisture in Vermont, it's going to come at different times. Uh, I mean, this winter has been uh, a really warm winter and we've gotten precipitation, but we haven't really gotten much in terms of, um, in terms of snow and we don't know what that'll happen in terms of, uh, you know, the snowpack in the spring, which can really help the first month and a half or so of, um, um, in terms of helping to keep the streams viable and, and uh, full enough of water. With less steady winters, the water temperatures in the summer hike well into the 70 degree range. There's less water in the rivers in the summer and they're warmer. It becomes a lot more challenging to think about where you're gonna trout fish in the summer. It's important to note that trout are cold-blooded and that their metabolism is severely influenced by water temperature. When pushed past their optimal temperature range, 
70 degrees for browns and rainbows, and 65 for brook trout. Trout are forced to stress themselves searching for extra food, or focus all their energy on survival, leaving them starving in a week. This issue is further increased by dams and culverts that block fish access to cold water refuge. However, the changes to the trout's habitat is not limited to the water. One of the predominant issues for Vermont's trout streams have been the influx of Japanese knotweed. Japanese knotweed is an invasive plant species that kills and outcompetes all others on the riverbanks, going so far as to travel by water to spread. The plant's shallow roots are weak and do little to prevent streamside erosion. You know, Japanese knotweed is probably the, one of the more obvious invasives that affect Vermont rivers and streams. Uh, and also it's somewhat, um, I won't say isolated, but it's specifically around, around central Vermont rivers, they're pretty common. Knotweed is, is also incredibly persistent. It's very difficult to eradicate. Um, I'm, unfortunately, I think that knotweed is sort of with us forever. But it is, uh, it is you know, more than a nuisance. It's, you know, it's de definitely a de detriment to a lot of the rivers and streams in Vermont. These streamside areas are important riparian buffers that control the flow rates of streams and the amount of toxins like phosphorus and nitrogen from farm manure that enter the water. The Dog River just south of Northfield has been particularly ravaged by this foreign menace. The banks are so covered with knotweed when moving from hole to hole, it's easy to forget you're not in an Asian jungle. The Dog River, we've spent um, a lot of time in terms of volunteer time and, and raised thousands of dollars to do riparian projects on the dog. And the idea there is to create um, some more stable stream banks and also cover, um, and also as, as, um, as these trees really get old and they begin to fall back in the rivers, then that's something that uh, also is good for habitat. Um, I mentioned before that you know there's this phrase that trout grow on trees and trees are essential in order to provide um, cover and um, uh, food as they decay for macroinvertebrates. Uh, and they also create um, you know, more stable banks so that when you have flooding issues that uh, you don't have as much erosion and siltation um, into the rivers. Despite the knotweed, the Dog River is still able to hold a large population of wild fish. It is particularly well known for its population of large, wild, elusive brown trout. The dog also holds a special place in my heart. While I was just starting to fish, my father and I went fishing there for the day. While walking up the bank, I was lucky enough to spot two brown trout that were over two feet swimming in the water. We failed to catch them, but seeing those fish got me hooked on fishing and showed me how large and beautiful a wild trout could be. Yet, this population is just a fraction of the size it was 10 to 15 years prior. Um, our chapter has begun to um, initiate a project on the Dog River to try to restore the wild trout population, which has really declined over the last 15 or 20 years. Thus, it is vital to do what we can to attempt to protect this riparian habitat. By planting native species and eradicating the knotweed, maybe the dog can return to its former glory. Yet, the most important aspect of our riparian habitat is the reason for our state's name, its trees. Famously, when Samuel D. Champlain sailed up the lake that would later bear his name, he christened the land he saw to the east as Vermont for its vast swathe of green mountains. Established in 1932, the Green Mountain National Forest is one of only two national forests in New England. It's a broadleaf temperate forest that runs along the granite backbone of the Green Mountains. Covering over 800,000 acres, it is home to a vast array of wildlife. Beaver, bear, moose, bobcat, all rely on the refuge and habitat created by the green aspect of Vermont's mountain range. The brook trout is no different than any of these others. From a conservation standpoint and a wild trout management standpoint, probably the most significant effect is habitat. And the biggest threats for them are would be habitat degradation um, in the form of um, development that's already there and development that could happen in the future. So development being construction of roads, buildings, other, th other things in close proximity to the stream or actually in the stream. However, the forest of today is almost entirely new. 
During the 1800s, the timber and livestock industry drove Vermont to clear cut much of its forest. Back in the late 1800s and early 1900s, Vermont was only 10% forested. So during the boom of the logging business that happened in the development of building cities back in Massachusetts, southern New Hampshire, southern Vermont, and um, Connecticut and Rhode Island, there were many, many logging operations in the state of Vermont that basically shipped the lumber down to the southern New England states. So a lot of the business in Vermont was either sheep farming or logging businesses back in the early 1900s. And we deforested a significant amount of Vermont's timber. As a result, that had a very huge significant effect on the habitat of Vermont's um, over 2,000 miles of brook trout streams. So if you're gonna float logs on rivers, you don't want all that wood in the stream, all the stuff that makes it hard to fish or the stuff that makes it walk difficult to walk or to boat in a stream, like those big boulders and those logs that the fish live in, uh, like to hide in. Uh, they got those out of there. Getting rid of the forest got rid of our sponge. And so we ended up having these rivers that did not have as much wood or boulders in them. And we didn't have the sponge soaking up the water. So when the rain came down, the rivers got a lot more powerful more quickly and really made the channels wider so that they could move water quicker. But in doing that, they became shallower. And then they also became warmer because we don't have our sponge anymore and we don't have the tree cover and we've got these wide, shallow rivers, which is what we see all over the state today. Yet resiliently, much of Vermont's forests have returned and over 75% of the state is covered in trees today. However, due to a boost in population from the coronavirus pandemic and the increase of the tourist and commercial economies, Vermont's forests have again to been slowly worn away again just 40 years after returning to steady levels. This change will have an effect on all of Vermont's fisheries and wildlife, particularly on its brook trout. Luckily, a series of Act 250 and other permits make it more difficult for landowners to clear cut trees and build alongside the waterways, destroying crucial stream habitat and riparian buffers. And there's really two kind of categories where we work on habitat for the benefit of trout. One would be on the protection side of it or conservation side. So we are involved in um, permits. Um, there are permits like Act 250 permit, um, stream alteration permit. Uh, these are permits that people need to get in order to say develop something in or near a stream. Judd Kratzer, a fisheries biologist for Mons Fish and Wildlife, has been part of a number of studies that have observed that within the last 70 years, Vermont's brook trout populations have not only remained consistent, but increased significantly. He's also headed a number of projects that have increased the amount of wood and trees with and around streams, and found that this has significant impact on the amount of brook trout present. And um, a lot of people assume that trout fishing is getting worse, especially wild trout. Uh, the wild trout populations are in peril, and they are in some cases for sure. Um, but uh, we actually completed a study a few years ago where we were able to compare trout populations in the 1950s uh, to trout populations in the 2000s um, in the same streams. And we were actually kind of surprised to find that brook trout abundance has act had actually increased over that time in those streams. In the last five, five or six decades, um, in our streams anyway, trout populations have been more or less stable it seems. And over the last century, Vermont's now 90% reforested. And what the Fish and Wildlife Department, along with some other New England states, has determined is that the improvement of a century of growth of habitat reforestation has played a much more significant role in improving Vermont's trout populations by improving habitat, insect life, spawning areas. Um, so the overwhelming um, statistics have proven that 
the density of biomass of fish in most of those wild trout streams is significantly better than it was 50 years ago. Thus, this is why a number of organizations, such as Trout Unlimited and different watershed groups, have begun to launch projects to plant trees along riverbanks in order to boost this riparian habitat and to help trout and our rivers in general. To put this theory to the test, we did what any self-respecting angler would do. We tied up our boots and strung up our rods, tying on bushy dry flies and heading to the most thick brush section of water we could find. It didn't take long to find what we were after. Charm, huh? I missed this guy twice. Finally, the third time got him. Gosh, look at those colors. So pretty. The hunt for big fish, it's easy to overlook the true beauty and purity of a native brook trout that's ancestors have lived in the same place for thousands and thousands of years. But chasing these little green and orange flying torpedoes merely demonstrates how overlooked and underappreciated they truly are. When you think about it, the fact that we have wild brook trout living all over the state except for the Champlain Valley um, is pretty, uh, makes those fish look pretty amazing that they, could, they can still thrive and survive. Of course, they're a lot smaller. Um, it's rare to find large brook trout anymore, like over 12 inches in our rivers and streams. They probably would have been a lot more common back then. But. Most people know of fish simply from finding Nemo, the aquarium, and fish and chips. It's one of the most enjoyable parts of my job as a fishing guide and the genesis for this project, to expose people to the intricate and diverse world that's underneath the water. Fish, unlike other wildlife, are able to simply go unnoticed by much of the public. And it's the key role of anglers in conservation to generate awareness to the world beneath the surface. One of the most apparent things I learned throughout this process is that the answer of how to improve and support our trout is simply not black or white. It lies somewhere in the gray area, in a compromise to both support the natural systems we're lucky enough to have here in our state, but also the growing industries and needs of the people who live here. However, there's one thing we can all agree on. I've so I think anglers can play a role in that. The other thing is become actively involved in conservation groups because they, they play a very 
significant role in habitat restoration, planting trees, improving river habitat, and it takes many hands to make light work. And by doing that, you get a volunteer base of 50 or 60 people on a spring day, and you can plant a significant amount of vegetation that can improve the habitat of the rivers. And you won't see the benefits of that necessarily for 10 to 15 years after the fact, but long term those play very major roles in improving the habitat for trout streams. And getting involved with um, cold water conservation in Vermont should get involved with, with an organization that promotes that, whether that be Trout Unlimited or the Wild Fish Coalition. The other part that people can do is get involved with watershed groups. Friends of the Winooski, Friends of the Mad River, then there are, um, boy, I don't know how many watershed groups there are in Vermont, but there's a lot. A culture right now that is not as outdoors oriented as it used to be, and that people are spending more uh, time inside, and more device driven kind of um, entertainment and that sort of thing. And um, I think that we all are part of that culture, but trying to get more people outside and, and, and kids involved with, with, um, with fishing and hunting and that sort of thing I think is really important. Anglers can be involved in that by advocating for, um, for fish habitat, trout habitat if that's what they're interested in, but just fish habitat in general. Uh, because there are people out there, especially people that aren't anglers, they either don't care about fish or they, they don't understand. And so anglers um, can help to advocate for fish habitat. Um, we're, we, are, we're, we are a native fish culture or, or about to roll out a, um, a um, stream um, restoration project. Yeah, we see angling as a good thing because it, um, gets people interested in, in our natural world, and fish in particular, but if people care about trout, they're gonna care about habitat, and they're gonna care about cold, clean water. Can we do a better job? Absolutely. There are definitely issues that we're still faced with as far as culverts that cross many of the roadways in the state that restrict or limit um, fish to be able to reach spawning areas, but the state's actually working to improve that as well. So in combination with the natural reforestation, better management of our, um, of our infrastructure, culverts, fish passageways, I think that Vermont trout populations are gonna significantly improve. Many people would be shocked to see the beautiful trout that may live in the creeks that run right through their backyards. During a trip to Maine, in an area where brook trout are able to flourish to their full former glory, due to an abundance of habitat, cold clean water, protective harvest regulations, and lack of non-native species, we were able to see the scale a brook trout can grow to. A few of my colleagues have even been lucky enough to tangle with brook trout of that size right here in Vermont.
As tourists keep moving here, our trout will become more and more transplants that match our population. In their own homeland, our state fish is at risk of potentially facing death by a thousand cuts. Their territory is being stripped away, one rapid, one pool, one pond at a time. Brook trout are Vermonters as much or more than anyone else. Their hardy spirit, resistance to the cold, and vibrant colors demonstrate their character. Many people would be shocked to note that brook trout of this size can still be found at Vermont streams. Certainly they're rare, but with the necessary habitat and the limiting of unnatural competitors and predators, brook trout of this size can make a return. This is possible. All this fish needs is a little help. <laughs> 